I'm quite interested in thinking about that notion of the hyphen, that, that little thing that's between, let's say, Chinese Canadian or Japanese Canadian. I'd like to kind of challenge those two uh, poles, those two hegemonous poles who want to claim a part of me, because I feel like I've lived in between, and I like the in between. Uh, it's, a, it's a place that I would like to uh, um, spruce up a bit. I'd like to, you know, <laughs> put some nice furniture in the in between place. On dating shows, they always have a white dating a white, or a Chinese dating a Chinese. They never have interracial dating on at all. Although now that I say that, on The Bachelor once in a while they have, you know, one Chinese girl and one, one black girl, but they never get past two roses. <laughs> I would say I was Canadian, but I was half German and half Indian. And then other people, other adults would say, no, 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 you're not, you're just Canadian. I don't think being half of anything is a bad thing, because I am the whole of me, which is composed of two halves, basically. <laughs> When I do identify myself as half-native, people kind of look at me kind of weird because they're like, oh, well, we thought you were part of our club. I have to say that I'm really, really fed up that we live in an either-or world right now. And being in between is just not being addressed. Teachers would uh, see me as a little Indian girl and the, the other Indian kids would see me as a privileged white girl or a privileged half-breed. I think that multiculturalism was never really designed to imagine me. Well, my I'm boss half from India, my Swedish, mom? German. Better watch out for the craw, better watch out for the goat. That's the mix, the breed, the half breed, metis, quarter breed, trace of a breed, true, demi, semi ethnic, polluted, rootless, living, technicolor snarl to complicate the underbelly panavision of racism and bigotry across this country. I know you're going to say that's just being Canadian. The only people who call themselves Canadian live in Ontario and have national sea to shining sea 2020 CPR vision. When I was in elementary school, we had to fill out a form at the beginning of each year. For the first couple of years, I was really confused. The problem was the blank after racial origin. I thought, well, this is Canada. I'll put down Canadian. But the teacher said, no, Freddie, you're Chinese. Your racial origin is Chinese. That's what your father is. Canadian isn't a racial identity. That's turned out to be true, but I'm not really Chinese either. Nor were some of the other kids in my class real Italian, Dukabor, or British. Quite a soup, Heinz 57 varieties. There's a whole bunch of us who've grown up as resident aliens living in the hyphen. Like the Chinese kids who came over after 1949 couldn't take me into their confidence. I always ended up playing on the other team, against them, because they were foreign and I was white enough to be on the winning team. When I visited China and I told the guide of our tour group that I was Chinese, he just laughed at me. I don't blame him. He, for all his racial purity so characteristic of mainland Chinese, was much happier thinking of me as a Canadian. Something over there, white, Euro, but not Chinese. That could be the answer in this country. If you're pure anything, you can't be Canadian. We'll save, the, we'll save that name for all the mixed bloods in this country. And when the cities have heritage days and ethnic festivals, there'll be a group I can identify with, the Canadians. When the government gives out money for cultural centers, we'll get ours too. These real Canadians could gain a legitimate, marginalized position. The French Canadians would have to be Quebecois. The Mennonites, Mennonite. Brits, Brit. And if you're a Scot from Hamilton or a Jew from Winnipeg, then be that. I don't care. But stop telling me what I'm not, what I can't join, what I can't feel or understand. And don't whine to me about maintaining your ethnic ties to the old country. Don't explain the concept of time in terms of a place called Greenwich. Don't complain about not being able to find Tootsie Rolls or authentic Mexican food north of the 49th. Sometimes I'd rather be left alone.
Well, first I was told I was Chinese. I didn't know who I was, and then a teacher told me I was Chinese because my father's Chinese, you know, I was filling out the forms in school. So, um, and the sort of finding out who I, who I am, uh, finding my identity, if you like, um, was more an identity that was being given to me. By, by others. Because of the way I look, I'm quite fair, so is my brother, I don't think I'm very often asked, what are you? I think um, when I was younger, I wouldn't necessarily even think to bring up the fact that I was part Native. Um, and as I got older and kind of with the whole thing when we got our status cards when I was younger and I started asking my mom questions, I started bringing up the fact that I was half native. And I think more often than what are you, people would say, oh, I don't believe you. When I was really little, and granted I was surrounded by other little children, um, I would often get asked if I was from Africa. So it would be as basic as that. And people were also really confused when they'd see my father, who's white, come and pick me up from school. And so they would assume I was adopted and ask me if I was adopted. And I'd say, I'm not adopted. But then they wouldn't understand that. And I didn't quite understand it either because I was only five or six. So Usually people think I'm Spanish, uh, Italian. I've, I've had uh, Aboriginal and I've had... Uh, Turkish in Germany, so a lot of different ethnicities that that uh, that don't belong to me. Lots of people come up to me and start talking in different languages and just assuming that I'm of that, like a lot of Arab, Chinese, um, Hawaiian. I get people ask me a lot if I'm Hawaiian. So just never, ever, ever does anyone say, oh, are you a mix of Afro-American and white? Never. <laughs> it's always... Yeah. I'm asked quite often about my racial background. Um, a lot of cab drivers ask, and they usually um, ask straight out, like, where are you from? And they, and they, they usually don't wait for the answer, but they'll, they'll start guessing right away. Because you look like, yeah, I think you're Greek, or I think you're Italian, or, or else they identify me as part of their own cultural group. Other Aboriginal people, though, can see straight away that I'm part Aboriginal. They identify with me um, pretty quickly. Oh, I'm asked that all the time, and how I answer it completely depends on how I feel about the person asking the question. So if I think that it's coming from a complete stranger, and I, sometimes the question feels really pointed, and feels really intrusive, and frankly feels really rude, I won't answer honestly. I'll just say, you know, sometimes I'll just say I was born in Honduras as a total shorthand for maybe that'll satisfy your question. I was living in Victoria at the time, and I was on a bus from downtown to my neighborhood in Fernwood, and there weren't that many people on the bus, and I was sitting close to the driver, so he and I started chit-chatting, and I guess as a way of getting around the question of asking me, what is your race, which in Canada I think is considered a very rude question, he asked me, where are your grandparents from? My mom's grandparents were born in Russia. So I said to the driver, they're from Russia. <laughs> and he literally pulled the bus over to the side of the road, stopped it, and turned right around in his seat and had a good stare at me. And he was like, really? And then he looked really flustered and embarrassed because he realized he was going to have to change his tactic and ask the more rude question, which is, what are you? What is your race? Because that, the tactic he took wasn't satisfying to him. It was a, pretty much an interrogation. Like, he didn't let up until he got his answer. I had to end up confessing. This is my parentage, this is who I am, and this is why I'm in Victoria. He wouldn't start the bus up until I, you know, gave him the answers that would satisfy him. When I'm feeling really cynical, I think that the motivation to ask, or maybe not the motivation, but the result of those kinds of questions is kind of, it revokes my Canadianness to say, what are you? Where are you from? It implies, it really implicitly implies, you can't be from here. Nobody who looks like you is from here.
It was probably when I was in elementary school. Um, one day, my teacher was having everyone say what their background was. And um, we're all going through and everyone's sticking up their hands and I stuck up my hand and I was like, well, I'm half native. About half the class kind of turned around and just looked at me and just the way that they were looking at me, like, what? Like, just kind of made me realize, okay, why didn't everyone turn around at anyone else in the class when they said where they were from? And there was no other native kids in my class, so, you know, like, I didn't have anyone to kind of look at and say, you know, what's going on here? At that point, I sort of started realizing that people think differently about you based on who you are, their preconceived ideas of where you've come from, and yeah, so from that point on, I kind of realized, oh, maybe I'll be more careful who I say this to. When I was growing up, I, I remember as a very young child watching Westerns and, you know, with cowboys and Indians. But I remember watching and wondering, okay, now where do I fit in here? If I was in this battle, where would I be? Like, uh, what would happen to me? I, I had different visualizations where I would be um, shot by an arrow on one side and shot by a gun on the other. And which, ha which side is native and which side is white? You know, how would they know? How would they know to pick that out? Or would I be picked up, scooped up by the, by the Indian warrior and taken away? Or would the cavalry rescue me? I used to wonder about that and I could never reconcile that and I figured that I'd probably be shot both ways. <laughs> I would say it was probably in grade one when uh, when I was, my, this girl I hung out with all the time was had straight blonde hair. Her name was Megan and she was, I really liked her. Anyway, and she was combing her hair or brushing her hair and I said, can I borrow your brush? And she said, I don't want your wiry black hair in my brush. And that was a moment that I will never forget in my life. It was that moment of me understanding the diff that there's a difference. And I didn't really necessarily know what the difference was, but that was it. Being an adult now, I can think, oh, I wish they had spoken to me about it more when I was a teenager. But when I was a teenager, I wasn't listening to anybody about anything, certainly no adults. So I don't know if it would have done much except make me feel even more alienated than I already felt from the people around me because I wanted so much to be like my white friends. I probably wouldn't have wanted to talk about it at all with anybody, you know, because that would acknowledge difference. That would acknowledge how different I was. I don't think I was interested. I, I think the only time that I felt really maybe different than the dominant culture was when you're most exposed in that in those sort of turbulent adolescent years. So junior high school would would bring to mind sort of those kinds of associations in my mind. If people knew my background, they would throw around maybe slang words like you know, German, they would associate Nazi, and then um, Indian, they would associate Paki, so then you'd get a collision of those two, and somebody actually called me Patsy, which was <laughs> kind of a, a weird uh, collision of uh, cultural uh, words that have a lot of emotional content, right? So. I think that my mom hadn't prepared me. She couldn't anticipate that I would be racialized or that these that I would be asked these questions. I didn't have any strategies for how to deal with it. So when it started happening, I was really vulnerable, I think. It was really hard for me. Elementary school was hard that way. I guess because I grew up um, just with my mom, there was just a huge absence in my life. I was always asked, are you adopted? 
there's a huge question mark in your life here. That so I was always called to account for those kinds of things, and I think people who grew up with both parents present or yeah, because if my dad were more in the picture, I think those questions would kind of be answered. My sister and I never told our mom what we were experiencing. I think it's because we always sensed like our mom wouldn't be able to help us or we kind of sensed that it would shock her. Because I think that my mom has faith um, in the non-racism of Canadians, in, you know, Canada's a liberal, multicultural place, and so she didn't expect those things to happen to us. And I think that my sister and I sort of protected our mom from that knowledge in a weird way. Growing up in the 40s and 50s in a mixed race family was fraught with racial tension. I didn't want to be Chinese. <laughs> in the 40s and 50s. You wouldn't want to be Chinese, that you were outcast. I identified more with the Chinese aspect because in a sense it was more different. And our family was made, to, was different. We were told we were different. We were put in our place. My father was always, you know, sort of tiptoeing through the, the white world and uh, got pretty good at it. There was a lot of bigotry and racism, particularly in small towns. And, uh, and at the same time in small towns, there was uh, a, a, the possibility to kind of negotiate that. My mother had been ostracized as a Swedish Canadian girl. She'd been ostracized by her family for marrying a Chinaman, because they were quite racist. So she wasn't particularly hot on, you know, the Swedish culture. Looking back on it, there were a lot of complications, but growing up in it, um, sort of one makes out, you know, the world as best they can. And as you can see, I'm white enough to, to get away with it. First, when he came out, <laughs> I was kind of surprised because he's very fair. Like he was a very, very fair baby. And then at the hospital, whenever I'd get a new nurse, they'd see me first and then see Ammon kind of double take. And I'd say, he looks just like me, doesn't he? They'd be like, yeah. You know, it's like, whatever. When he was a newborn still, actually, and I had my brother and sister with me, my younger brother and sister, and Ammon, and I'd be feeding him, breastfeeding him in the park, and a lady... Her kids came up and said something to me, whatever, I didn't say anything, and then I don't even remember what they said, but they went back to their mom and she said, that's not her baby. That's not her baby, she's babysitting. And I just was shocked. Like, I just, I don't understand why you would say that to somebody. I think they probably came up and asked if it was my baby, and I said, yeah, but I don't know why you would ever say to somebody that it wasn't yours. You know, because it's just, you know, it's your child, this, the thing you love the most, and someone's telling you it's not yours, that they don't even know, right? They have no clue. And I was quite irate. I always paint my toenails the same color, and Ammon was probably two, maybe one and a half, and he wanted his done too, pretty, like he always wanted his feet prippy, as he called it. So I had, uh, it was in the summer, I'd take my shoes off and I'd paint my toes a different color and put them up on the coffee table. He came up and leaned in real close, and he's looking at them, and he looks at his foot, and I said, are mommy's toes prippy? And he said, yeah, yeah, and then he said, mommy, your foot's brown and my foot's white. I was like, ah. Up until that point, he obviously hadn't seen any difference in it, right? And I said, yeah, you're right. You know, mommy has brown feet and, and Ammon has white feet. And then for a couple of days, we went on and he'd say, oh, Ducky's feet are green or Buddy's feet are blue, whatever his stuffed animal. And then, you know, I'd ask him, so what color are granddad's feet? And he's like, oh, brown and daddy's feet. And I, he'd say, oh, white. So it's just kind of interesting to see him see a difference. A couple of years ago, he was coming home from daycare and saying stuff that um, his white mommy, and, and I'd say to him, well, you don't have a white mommy, and I'd get a little bit, you know, a little bit, bit upset. Mommy's brown, you know, when it's very t -t 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 sticky about that, and then, and I was kind of wondering, questioning where he got that from, and my guess would be, you know, he'd overheard someone saying it at daycare, because he's very fair, right, so they assumed that his mom would be white, and I don't know, maybe even someone was saying, oh, that's not his real mommy, like, that's the dad's girlfriend or whatever.
Whenever I think I might be white, it is revealed that I share in the plight, ancestral fight. Whenever I raise my fist red in protest, it is manifest that I'm not counted amongst the rest. Authenticity test. When I was uh, in university, I, I realized that the um, empiricists were the British to a large extent, and uh, so I, I kind of had a struggle around that because I had already, um, as a child, had a pride in being part British, even though the roots really were Celtic, but it was uh, British. I um, spoke the Queen's English and uh, enjoyed tea, and we had impeccable table manners, so there was a pride associated with that. And then when I uh, learned more about the history of colonization across the globe, then I actually um, felt ashamed. The blood of colonizers runs through my veins at the same time, uh, so does the blood of those who have been colonized. So yeah, it was a bit of a strange experience, but I had to reconcile that. I go into and out of my sense of myself as a raced person. And I think that's why I do check in with people. I check in and go, so how are you seeing me? Like, because I think the category, you go into it and out of it fluidly. Just as I'm not every day, consciously, every minute of the day thinking, I'm a woman. Walking down the street, I'm a woman, I'm a woman. You know, it's, you don't think like that. And neither am I constantly thinking of myself, oh, I'm mixed, I'm mixed. I do find that I become more black when I'm with black people. If I hang out with just black friends, I suddenly find myself talking in a way that my white friends would be like, oh my God, that doesn't sound like Karina. I think that there's always part of me that feels like a fraud, that feels somehow phony, like, oh, I'm not really black, I'm, I'm mixed, or I don't even really know, like, I don't come from a really black household, so how can I represent? Like, how can I really be black? There's the, really that crisis of inauthenticity, I think. Um, yeah, I don't expect to be questioned, but I question myself sometimes. If I choose to identify with something that is German about me or Indian about me, then I don't necessarily want to be uh, questioned about it. I think I know why I'm doing it, right? It's a, it's a big part of who I am, my ethnic identity. I think uh, a lot of my interests in film are influenced by my cultural upbringing. Disadvantages that it brings are an inability to pick and a, a satisfying frame of reference. One thing that used to really bother me was that I had no home country, which sounds a bit weird, but I, I. I think when I was in my early 20s, I really wanted to go someplace where everybody was like me. I think because uh, when I was younger, because so many people read me as being 100% black, I would often emphasize that I was part German, often to no avail, because people didn't quite understand what that meant because of the way I look. You know, there's that, there's that sense of we know ourselves by our resistances, right? Like you don't know a wall's there until you kind of run up against it. So you get to know yourself by what's, what is resisting you. In 1963, I got the opportunity to go to graduate school. 
in the United States. And um, I found out that in order to work down there, I needed a work visa. The American consulate in Vancouver, I, I called them to say, well, when is my visa going to come through? And they said, oh, you know, it'll be three or four years. You're on the Asian quota. And I said, well, what, what do you mean I'm on the Asian quota? I'm Canadian. They said, yeah, but, you know, you're, you're Asian. You're, you know, your name's Wa. That's an Asian name, right? And, and uh, I was just, you know, flabbergasted. So I just hung up the phone and I drove down to the American consulate and I said, what's going on here? What, this is outrageous that you're, you know, you're, not, you're putting me on what you're calling an Asian quota. I'm not from China, I'm from Canada. He said, but you're Asian. I said, I said, yeah, but he said, and then he said, but you don't look Asian. I said, well, you know, I'm only 25%. And he says, oh, that's okay then. You know, as long as you're, you know, 50%, <laughs> less than 50%, that's fine. You can come in. <laughs> Half breed. Half, half white. Mixed race. Mixed. Biracial. Mutt. Octoroon. Mixed race. Mulatto. Half. Half black, half white. Which half? Top half, bottom half. Half breed. A half blood. Half this and half that. Part. Mixed genetically. Half breed. Blended. Being half anything, I don't think it's good. It's all what you choose to identify with. I like the idea of being part. I'm always questing for a word that because that kind of implies being part of. It implies a community. I went to high school in Zimbabwe. My mom joined World University Service of Canada. She joined WUSC. And so my mom and my sister and I packed off to rural Zimbabwe, a small missionary school out in the bush there. My sister and I were the only non-black, non-Zimbabwean girls at the school. And that was a really um, significant shift for me. Like, I realized there that people didn't see me as black there. I was seen as white. I wasn't even seen as mixed, I was seen as white. For the three years that I was in Zimbabwe, I thought of myself as white Canadian, which, you know, was very, I was really dislodged and displaced when I came back to Canada when I was 18 and I, you know, found out that that, that couldn't really be my identity here. I was not seen as a white, you know, white mainstream Canadian. I was seen definitely as some of colour. So yeah, there was a shift. You know, the agenda of of, of those pure places is always to protect their purity. And uh, um, because I grew up in Canada where the pure element was white, when I went to China, I thought, oh good, I'm going to, I, I, always, I always kind of uh, related to the Chinese part of myself as being, in a sense, more authentic, more, um, uh, more me, more, more, I don't know, uh, more real uh, because it, it was it was the mixed part of me if you like but when I went to China the Chinese are <laughs> in a sense they're even uh, you know there are more bigots <laughs> and racists in China <laughs> as well I mean they want to be Chinese they, they don't, they're, not, they're not interested in mixed you know so when I said to them I'm Chinese they just laughed at me I can't say I'm Chinese in China I never really feel like I fit in definitely anywhere. When I go back home, you know, people can say, oh yeah, you're related to so-and-so, oh yeah, this, you know, oh yeah, I know your aunt. But I always look different from them. And because of that, I know my life experience is different. A pretty common question when I get on rotation is saying I'm in the First Nations program, and people will be like, oh, why? Like, why they would ask me that, I don't know. Like because I don't look maybe like I'm Native and why would I be interested in that? I have to constantly question my, myself. Well, why am I doing this? Is this adding to what I want to do? Pe do people want me here? Um, so I think some of, it, some of it is choosing that identity and then by choosing that identity, I get you know something like other thoughts imposed on me because I'm there. 
sometimes I feel like because I'm so interested in this that I'm betraying, you know, my dad or his family in a way. And I mean, that's never, you know, the way that I wanted to approach it. And I think my, my dad understands why I'm looking into this, but he also knows like I've never had the opportunity to before, the means to, or, you know, maybe didn't really understand if I had a reason to. When you're of someone of mixed race and people might not assume it, looking at you, you make a lot of choices. I could choose to, you know, completely ignore and never tell anyone about my mom's background. And sure, maybe it would make life a lot easier sometimes. I'd have to ask a lot less questions of myself. But um, at the same time, my life, I think, wouldn't be nearly as interesting. People are racialized by others. I don't think one grows into, comes into the world saying, wow, I'm Chinese. <laughs> or even, wow, I'm different. <laughs> you know, they, we all think we're the, we all want to be the same in a certain way. At the same time, we all want to be singular. I guess I remember differences with the hair, for sure, because I had more of an afro than, more fuzzy hair, it wasn't really ever, ever quite an afro, and I always wanted, you know, the blonde, silky hair, and I don't know if that came from Barbie, or all the dolls had hair like that, but I was young, I don't even know, and I remember I'd put a towel on and pretend it was hair, because it sw would swing, because my hair, you know, it's straightened now, but before it, it didn't, like it just was, didn't blow in the wind. I mean, I went through a terrible phase when I was a teenager, a younger teenager, when I wanted to be white. And so I, one of the significant markers for me of being white was having long, straight hair. It was an eternal source of frustration for me to the point that at one, at one point I just cut it all off. So I just lost it over my hair. My hair has always been extremely weighted for me because it's such a, a marker Blonde hair and blue eyes was associated with being beautiful, and that's what everyone wanted to be. So I was very proud that I looked that way. Yeah, it is kind of ironic because later on in life, when you know I'm at an Aboriginal gathering or people are looking at me saying, "I don't believe you that you're half Native," you know, I feel like I lose part of my credibility because I look different from everyone around me. Growing up. Before whatever I became politicized in university, I definitely wanted to be white. I definitely wanted to be more white. Um, stayed out of the sun. But after that, I really, I really wished that I could look more black. Like I just wanted, you know, like it would be so great for people to just look at me and instantly know. That, that whole push in this country in, when I was growing up, was towards uh, this mono, uh, a monoculture, pretty much a white monoculture. I think in the last 30 years, there's a, 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 a lot of people of difference, uh, either through race or through color or through sexuality or whatever, have found, have been more sustained by um, the ability to articulate difference. The first 40 years of my life, I was identified as white. That was my status, if you like. Uh, a very low-class white, because I was contaminated with this, this other, this Asian thing. So my, white, my whiteness, it was a contaminated whiteness for the first 40 years of my life. Around 1980, the cultural discourse shifted and I became more racialized. That is, I became more engaged and more identified as being a raced person because I said I was interested in that. That notion that multiculturalism is, is made up of a bunch of pure or uh, homogenous entities, it, it gets more and more problematic for those of us who are not. Who are, who are mixed, who are between those entities. 
I have to say that I'm really, really fed up that we live in an either or world right now. And being in between is just not being addressed or or it's being addressed as in why would you want to talk about you know if you're half white which some people aren't why would you want to talk about the white side you know what kind of cop out is that what are you trying to what kind of privileges are you trying to afford yourself i guess that's part of the awkwardness is feeling like i don't really i sh i shouldn't be considered a minority should i um because you know i am canadian right what a Canadian looks like, I think the answer would probably be um, your average Caucasian person. Well, well, what I think of immediately are the beer commercials. Oh, I am Canadian, so a young Caucasian me. Uh, I believe in peacekeeping, not policing. Diversity, not assimilation. I wouldn't mind being a Canadian if I could just be a mixed person. <laughs> you know, a Canadian met mixed person. But uh, it doesn't. Canadian still means white, European, and uh, that's the picture the rest of the world has. My name is Joe, and I am This summer I was crossing the border with my husband, and when the border guard looked at my passport, he asked me all kinds of questions about where's your mom from, where's your dad from, how long have you been in the country, there was a whole shakedown. When the border guard asked my partner, he looked at my partner's passport and he looked at him and he said, are you 100% Canadian? And he's like, that's right, I'm 100% Canadian. And I realized I will never, no matter how long I'm in Canada, be 100% Canadian. I don't hold citizenship to any other nation. I only hold Canadian citizenship, yet I'll never be 100% Canadian. I think that's how it shakes down. In the past, uh, like I said, in my red power phase, I might have said, no, I'm not, I'm not Canadian. But I, I am Canadian. I know that if I went to another country, uh, my being Canadian would come out in bolder relief than being Aboriginal. What I like about Canada, not that it necessarily works this way, but at least we think about, theoretically, we think about how everybody is included here official policy it's something that appears you know in official documents and government documents in documents that affect a lot of people in this country I guess what's important for me is that he accepts that there's everybody's different right there's different races and respects them all right like everybody's got their different ways and stuff so it's not so important for him to know, you know, the black background or the Irish background or whatever. It's just because it's kind of all blended now. It doesn't really make a difference to me. There's a lot more mixed kids on the street now. It's really common for me to see white moms pushing like mixed race babies down the street. It's totally common, I think, for my kids, for that generation. They're going to have a really different experience than me because when I grew up, I thought me and my sister were the only mixed kids in the world. I've been blessed with this countercultural perspective. Not just double consciousness, but like triple, quadruple consciousness. You know, living in Canada, but living in Canada as a woman, as a mixed woman, as a woman from all these different backgrounds, as an immigrant. So I think that, yeah, you get this amazing perception on, on the world. I don't think it can be put to rest until people feel comfortable with various aspects of their being. Um, and that's an individual journey, but of course an entire population's worth of people are going through that in any blanketed nation category, right? So um, I don't think there'll ever be a point where we're all just gray. I don't think there'll ever be a point where all we're just identifying with being human whatever that means, right? Because it doesn't mean anything to me, except that we're all entitled to some semblance of equality. How can we be more creative and more, more generous around the whole question of being mixed and explore its potential 
as, as human beings. Uh, as, as, um, and, I th and I think we are. I mean, I can see it happening. I see younger people who are just so, you know, they're so enjoying their, their mixed world. I think I'm becoming just more comfortable with who I am as I get older. You know, I look like both sides of my family and, you know, this is, this is the way I turned out and part of what I'm learning is to just be happy about that and to know, you know, what parts I've taken from each side and to try and put them together in the best way that I can. I don't think people are thinking in terms of purity. I don't think they're thinking in terms of pure bloodlines anymore. I think that most people are thinking of themselves as hybrid to some extent. With globalization, I think Canada is thinking of itself a little bit different now. I think there's some kind of change in its imagination of itself. And I think the world is trying to see itself as more diverse. Hybridity now is kind of like a buzzword and it's it's fashionable and the nation wants to show other nations how great it is at incorporating all these others. So I don't know, there, there might be a shift from multiculturalism to something else, to something global, something more along the lines of hybridity, where it's not the hyphen so much as a mix. I was just working with that, working in a poem with that song that Bing Crosby sang in the 40s, uh, Mr. In Between, you know, uh, accentuate the positive, uh, stay away from the negative, uh, don't, don't mess around with Mr. In Between. <laughs> I want to mess around with Mr. In-Between. I am Mr. In-Between.